Hello and welcome to this video about simple harmonic motion. So in this video I'm looking specifically at spring oscillation. In a follow-up video I'm going to look at pendular and also at circular motion which are different examples of SHM. But let's get started with mass and spring system. So before we even get started, what do we mean by simple harmonic motion? Well it has a few key points that you need for it to be in simple harmonic motion. So first of all, the object needs to be oscillating and its acceleration at any moment in time should be directly proportional to its displacement from the equilibrium position and the acceleration or the restoring force as it's sometimes said should always be directed toward back towards the equilibrium position from wherever it is. So that's a lot of terminology I've just used. Let's start defining some of that terminology. So first, what is an equilibrium position? Well, I've got a mass spring system right here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let it hang. So we've got it here, and it's just hanging. And if I allow it time to settle, it will just occupy a fixed position. This one might not, because I'm not sure I can stop my arm shaking long enough to do it. So when it settles in a fixed position, that's the equilibrium position. Why is it called that? Because the upward force from the spring is in equilibrium with the weight force of the mass downwards. That's your equilibrium position. Okay, so we've got the first condition here. When the, when the system is at the equilibrium position, essentially its displacement from the equilibrium position will be zero. And you can see that in this situation, its acceleration is zero because the resultant force is zero. So that's our first scenario there where it's not even oscillating at all. So let's have a look what happens if we displace it downwards. So now what we've got is, what do I mean by that? Okay, so this was its equilibrium position. Let's displace it downwards. And I do that by applying an external force to move it to that position. And then what I'm gonna do is release it so that external force is no longer a factor. So we can see here that having extended the spring, when I release this, the upward force from the spring is going to be bigger than the downward force of the weight. Why? Because we've stretched it out. And we can even calculate the increase in force from the spring. It's going to be equal to K times the amount I displace it. So now the resultant force acting on the object is going to be equal to K times X. Because the weight force and the original force are going to cancel each other out, the resultant force is just going to be Kx using Hooke's law. And so what we can see from that is if the resultant force is directly proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium position, then so is the acceleration going to be. So we've got that if we displace it downwards, the acceleration and the, for the, acceleration and the displacement are directly proportional. And if we think about the direction of the force, if I displace it downwards, then the force is upwards. So again, in the opposite direction, the force is towards the equilibrium position. So that works if we displace it upwards. So let's try it in the, if we just place it uh, upwards as well. Okay, so here's our equilibrium position. So if we apply an external force now to displace it upwards, what we've done is decrease the extension of the spring. So we've decreased the upward force, meaning the resultant force is now downwards. And we've decreased the upwards force by an amount kx. So now the resultant force, I would say, is minus kx, because it's the force in the opposite direction changed to what we had before. So we've got resultant force of minus kx, which means when we displace the mass upwards, the resultant force is downwards back towards the equilibrium position. So again, in the opposite direction to displacement, and again, directly proportional to the displacement. So we've got our conditions of SHM shown there, by this system in the three different like, positions it can be above, below, and at the equilibrium position. This is in SHM. So in terms of what that looks like, I realize I haven't actually shown you what SHM looks like. Essentially, this is SHM. It's just as like it's going to be oscillating, in this case, upwards and down with springs. Sometimes you get it sideways as well. Um, but this is essentially what it looks like, and it's oscillating about the equilibrium position. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is some of the calculus that we can use to derive the equations we use to model an object in SHM. So the derivation process for this is not part 
of the A-level course. If any of you thinking of going on to do like maths, physics or engineering and stuff should really pay attention to this because this is really what you'd get into at that kind of level. So let's go through it and then the end result is realistically what you need for this part of the course and we'll have a look at that in a minute. So we're going to take the example we were looking at before where we displace the object downwards. So we know the resultant force is directed upwards. And we calculated it if we define the downwards direction is positive, we know the resultant force is going to be negative or in the upwards direction, and it's going to be equal to kx. So hence, the resultant force is minus kx here. If we divide resultant force by mass, we will end up with acceleration. So we can get an expression for the acceleration in terms of the spring constant, in terms of the mass of the system, and of the displacement of the object from the equilibrium position. Now, those of you who get on to do M2 and M3, the mechanics modules in maths, will come across this relationship here. Essentially, you can calculate acceleration not just as the rate of change of velocity, but you can also do it using this expression, the velocity, multiplied by uh, the differential of velocity with respect to displacement. And we can check that that works by thinking about the units involved. So, velocity has a unit of meters per second. A change in velocity also has the unit of meters per second. So what we've got at the moment is meters squared s to the minus 2. We're going to divide that by change in displacement, meters, so we've got meters per second squared. So you can see this expression works in terms of units. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the dx over to the other side, and the way we get rid of those partials is by integrating. So now we need to think about what the limits of our integration are here. So when we displace the object down, we can see it starts at a velocity of zero. So we're going to put the first limit of the velocity, integration with velocity as zero. It also starts at its maximum displacement, which is known as the amplitude. So we're going to start the integration with respect to distance at the amplitude here. Okay, so where is it going to end up? Well, we want to know what the velocity is at a displaced, given displacement x. We don't know what x is yet, so then we'd use that x to find v. So we're going to integrate between v and the velocity and x in where we're integrating with respect to the displacement here. Um, acceleration isn't a function of displacement at the moment, so what we're going to do is substitute in this expression we had here for acceleration, which is a function of displacement. And that's what we've got here, and I've just taken all the, the minus km outside because those are all constants. So once we integrate that, we can get this expression here, and we can cancel out the halves, and we can uh, cancel out the minus sign in here and switch what's around in the brackets, and then finally we can square root it at the end to end up with this expression for the velocity at a given displacement x. And it's equal to the plus or minus square root of k over m, multiplied by a squared, the amplitude squared, minus the displacement squared, or x squared. So with this expression here, if you look in the formula sheets that you get, it's very, very close to one of them you get. And we'll see in a minute how we can adjust it slightly to make it exactly the same. But before we can do that, we need to look at this SHM from a different perspective. So we've looked at acceleration, and we found essentially velocities at different displacements. Or what if we want to find the velocity at a moment in time instead of at a fixed displacement? Well, we can do that. So what we're going to do is model the displacement using this cosine function here. So let's dig into how that works. So when we start an object oscillating, we're going to start it from its maximum displacement because we have to give it an initial displacement. That's why we need a cosine function because it's got to start at a maximum at time equals zero. Then, after one full time period, it needs to go all the way up and all the way down back to maximum displacement. So the 2 pi over t here is to make it so after one time period, it starts the whole cycle again. So time period is the time it takes to complete one full oscillation. So you can see when we put in t equals the time period, we get cosine of 2 pi, which in terms of radians is back to the star again. And then finally, we need to make sure that at time zero, the displacement is the amplitude. So we multiply the whole thing by the amplitude or the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position. 
So that's how we get displacement, and as you should know from your mechanics before, to go from displacement to velocity, all we need to do is find the rate of change of it, which is the same as finding the derivative with respect to time. So that's what we're going to do here. So if you haven't got to this stage yet in maths, essentially you can, there are set, set ways to take the derivative of sine and cosine functions. So to go from a cosine function, the derivative is a minus sine function, and you in maths you'll explore why that's the case. And so that's why I've got minus sine here. And what you also do is take whatever's multiplying by the t inside the function, you multiply that outside here. So that's why we get this expression here. We can do the same process again to get acceleration, but a minus sign, take the derivative, you get a minus cosine function, and again you take the 2 pi over t outside. So that's why we've got 4 pi squared over t squared. So what you notice here is a, cosine 2 pi over time period times t, is the displacement. So we can take all of that out and just put in its place displacement. And you can see here, we've got this sort of similar expression to what we had before, acceleration and displacement are directly proportional, but we've got a different constant here. And you should know that frequency is one over time period, so this is the most common way you will see this expression right here in terms of 2 pi f squared as your constant. Okay, so why have we gone through this process? Well, now it allows us to find a way of relating the time period of the frequency to the spring constant and the mass. So that's why this is useful. So let's have a look at that. So we've got these two equations at the moment for the acceleration in terms of the displacement. So what we can do is equate the two constants together that we've done here. Obviously we don't need the minus signs, they cancel out. And we can rearrange to get an equation for the frequency. This is known as the natural frequency of the system, or the frequency at which the system would oscillate if no forces are applied during the oscillation, or called free oscillation. If we flip that whole thing over, we can get expression for the natural time period, or the time period of an oscillation, where again, when we're not applying any external forces to it, and that's this one here, and typically at A level, this is the one you see in your formula sheet here. Once you get onto sort of like degree level physics and engineering and stuff, you will more commonly see it in this form. So I don't know why A level insists on this one so much. Um, probably because you actually in your experiments time the oscillation. Um, but we get these useful expressions to calculate what's called the natural frequency or the natural time period of the spring system when we set it oscillating in free vibration. Okay, okay. so I'm going to finish up by summarising the equation we've got. And as I said earlier, look at transforming the equation we had for velocity in terms of displacement into what you'll see in your formula sheets. So these over here are the expressions we've derived already in terms of the acceleration and the natural frequency and time period. And this is the equation we derived for velocity earlier in terms of the displacement. So um, I said earlier we're going to switch it around, so that's what we're going to do. So we've seen before that k over m is equal to 2 pi f squared. So we can substitute that in for that. So we can then take it outside the square root because it's squared. So that's where we get this expression, which is usually in your formula sheet here, in terms of the velocity there. Or sometimes you even see that written as an omega. Uh, those of you who've done circular motion will know where that comes from. So we can actually work out what the maximum velocity is in a cycle. So we can see from here, to get maximum velocity, we need to make the displacement from the equilibrium position equal to zero, because then we'll just get this expression, 2 pi f a. We can do a similar process for the acceleration here. So acceleration is maximized when this cosine function is going to be equal to 1. So let's do that. And we can see that we end up with maximum acceleration is 2 pi f squared a multiplied by minus 1. And that would then allow us to work out what the maximum force is in there, which could be useful to us when we're modeling this system. So when you're dealing with a math spring system, these are the equations you have to model how it's going to behave in different scenarios. And this is what, uh, or a more slightly more complex version of this people would use in for them modeling things like earthquakes, making musical instruments, all those kind of things, these are very useful for. Um, and the last thing I just mentioned is the required practical that's on this topic. Essentially, what you end up investigating is this equation right here, or essentially the same as this one. You look at how different factors can affect 
the time constant of the oscillation, so varying mass, varying spring constant, those kind of things, and you'll see this relationship unfold. Okay, so that finishes this video looking at SHM in terms of springs. I'm going to follow this up with going through the same process for a pendulum, and then after that look at the similar process for circular motion as well. So I hope you found that useful. If you have had any questions, please do feel free to ask. And as I said earlier, don't worry too much if you don't understand what's going as part of the derivations. It's the equations you use for modeling that are more useful and knowing the conditions of SHM that are required for A-level. But if you do get those, that's fantastic. Um, that'll be very useful to you later on.